Hello, awesome and amazing people. Uh, this is Donna Brighton, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar today, which is all about failure proofing your projects. So I got the inspiration from a presentation I did recently at the Million Dollar Consulting Convention in Boston. It was a really well received presentation. And if you're interested in that, you can actually get a copy of the video from Alan Weiss. Um, I took the inspiration from that particular presentation and created a custom version just for you. But before we get into the content, I would like to say welcome. I'm Donna Brighton. And I am Scott Belke of Brighton Leadership Group, coming to you live from Chicago. Fabulous. So before we get into our content for the day, I would just like to remind you of your brilliance. Um, that is a fundamental concept. We believe that each and every one of you listening to this presentation has incredible brilliance, and we want to do whatever we can to help you get that brilliance out in the world. So in our conversation today, the focus is not around the business of consulting. This is not about building a consulting practice or marketing or methodology. The goal for our time together today is to help you as a consultant, whether you work internally or externally, uh, bring your ideas, insights, and tools that we have so that you can increase your success. So this is all around the delivery side of consulting versus the business of consulting. And again, this is all about you and your success. Um, and we're going to include some of our uh, discoveries in the interest of neuroscience, as well as some change insights. So that's what we're going to do today. And I'm so excited you're here and joined us. Now, it was really interesting as we were preparing for this webinar, because sometimes people say, oh, I'm only a consultant if I have that like title in my, um, you know, in my business card. But the reality is, I love this definition from Peter Block that most of us do consulting whether or not it's an official role. We are challenged to help change or improve a situation and oftentimes we don't have direct control. Now, say you're in project management, you may be responsible for implementation, but think about it. That's just managing the process of getting something implemented. There's a whole lot of other people that are involved in making that successful. So we're going to talk about that, and these are the components we're going to discuss today. The first one is you, <laughs> because let's face it, if you aren't at your best, how are you going to deliver? And we want you to be at your best because how well you deliver really does matter on how well you feel, how well you execute, how well you perform. And then we're going to talk about your work. And the work is all about three steps. So I'll cover that in just a minute, but we're going to start off with you. So for this particular insight, this was one of the biggest learnings, and probably this is familiar to many of you, but I, I was a huge fan of Franklin Covey. Every year, I couldn't wait to get my planner and fill in my, my priorities. I would ABC everything. and Consequently, I was really, really into time management. And then I had my bubble burst. I came to understand that you can't manage time because we all have the same amount. So if you really want to get into peak performance, it's actually not about time management. It's about energy management. So this is the book that blew my mind and helped me understand that while it's really important to manage our time, whether or not something scheduled is less relevant than whether you have the energy and the mental capacity to do it well. So that's why energy is so important. Now, um, in the book, it talks about these four dimensions. And it's kind of fascinating because a lot of times, you know, when we're thinking about performance, you're just thinking maybe mental, right? Or maybe even physical. But in the book, it talks about four separate but related sources of energy. So when your physical energy is at peak, your capacity for physical energy, that's reflected in your ability to expend and recover energy at the physical level. So that's like, are you able to stand up in, in front of the group that you're working with and really kind of um, fully maintain that, um, 
energetic state. And then, of course, there's emotional, which has to do with the quality of your energy, mental, which is your focus, because while time may be a precious resource, attention is one of the most limited resources today. Um, and that's a whole other conversation. But mental is really about the focus of your energy. Are you able to maintain focus? And then spiritual is about the force of energy and your um, kind of your purpose. So one of the things um, Scott and I passionately believe in as we've been growing our business is the importance of learning and growing. And so we read this book and just felt how important managing your energy was. So we actually went through something called the corporate athlete, which was a program where we learned how to put all this into action. So Scott, you want to talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, it was a fantastic experience. What I really appreciated about it, well, I don't know if I appreciated it, but first day I walked in and there was someone standing there with needles in their hand because they <laughs> wanted to stick it into my arm, draw blood. Next thing I had to do was go get uh, my body composition measured. So it was three pretty intense days that were filled with a focus on your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health, your spiritual health, combined with a lot of data. And what they did with the data was rather than just dumping on you, they walked you through it and explained what it meant and how it would react your energy throughout the day. So the entire premise is about managing your energy and being peak performance throughout the day. And it really made, it's, I guess it's kind of been foundational for us from a, um, from a performance perspective in how we have uh, performed in our business. Very helpful. Absolutely. And so this matters to you in terms of failure proofing your projects and being successful because um, it's about creating a life and your life consists of all of these elements so that you can accomplish your purpose. So that was one really important learning for us. Um, another dimension in terms of our learning, um, we've gotten really excited in the area of neuroscience. And why this has been so fascinating is it connects brain research, like actually hard science about the brain and relates it back to behavior and learning. And it's benefited us in two ways, personal performance. So again, you serving in the role of a consultant, how are you able to, to operate at peak performance? And then as you remember from the definition of consulting, any type of consulting is that you're trying to affect change and do that in the context of a culture or an environment. So being clear and understanding some of the principles of neuroscience have been absolutely foundational and essential for us. Now, this, the goal of this presentation is not to get into all the insights that we've learned about neuroscience. So here's a few resources that we found extraordinarily helpful. But one in particular I'd like to call out is the book on the lower left, Stealing Fire. So anybody out there, have you read Stealing Fire, ever heard of it before? Just curious. Give us a shout out on the chat if Stealing Fire is something you, you're familiar with. So we read this book and it was amazing because it was really talking about an industry that we hadn't realized, but what was the figure, Scott? It was like a multi-billion trillion. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was trillion, but it's certainly billion. Yeah, so it's a huge industry all about um, the, being in a state of flow. Mm -hmm. And so um, Scott's actually going through the flow fundamentals course that comes from the Flow Genome Project for the second time. So can you share with everyone why flow is so important and what you're getting out of the program? Oh, I'd love to. Um, this top, this is something I talk about all the time. I would sum it up as it's exercise for my brain. It's about creating altered states of consciousness where you're at a, a peak level of performance and creativity. I find it to be stress reducing, physically stimulating, focus inducing, and productivity enhancing. What I'm learning is how to get the maximum efficiency and effectiveness out of my brain. As a consultant, it helps me to be a better coach, uh, a better listener, and to be more creative on the fly and to be more in the moment when I'm working with very, very difficult and, I guess, um, wa um, wicked uh, problems that we're trying to solve. Consider this for a moment because this is not new information. McKinsey did a 10-year study, a global study of companies, and in that study they found top executives, meaning those 
most called upon to solve strategically significant, quote, wicked problems. They reported executives being up to 500% more productive in flow. So think about this and how that impacts competitive advantage. Executives who can function in flow states get as much creative breakthrough and wicked problems solved on a Monday as their competition gets done in a week. So I recommend uh, for you to explore and understand flow so you can increase your productivity and consulting success. Absolutely. So this first section was really all about you because what we're suggesting is in order to failure proof your projects and deliver at your best, then you need to take care of yourself. And so again, managing your energy and understanding flow and being able to operate in that flow state are two of the ways that we've personally learned and have been applying. So this wasn't an advertisement for signing up for any courses. We just wanted you to have this information so that you can be at your best. So now let's focus on the actual work that you do. So you're operating at your peak and now let's talk about uh, the actual consulting. So regardless of the type of consulting you do, internal, external, if you work in change, projects, engineering, quality, there's lots of different ways that you might do consulting, but I think it's pretty safe to say there's three basic dimensions that all of you follow. You all start or set up the project, you implement or do something, and then you close it. So I'm going to follow that construct as we talk through um, failure-proofing your project. So when you begin a consulting assignment, there's a couple key steps that you follow as an expert in your field. So think about this project start as managing the overall consulting process. We're not talking about a specific methodology. You're gonna use that regardless of what we're gonna share with you. This is just something, again, to add on top of that, that methodology that you're already using. So when you begin your project, there's three key things we'd like to suggest that are absolutely essential in failure-proofing your projects. So you can see here, you need to set expectations, validate success, and then build level two relationships. So what does all that mean? First of all, Setting expectations is really essential, and I've learned this through my uh, decades of consulting. I came to this insight that, um, and this is probably not surprising to any of you, we all operate very differently. We uh, desire different levels of communication in terms of the amount of detail that we want to receive. Um, we work differently in terms of you know, what time of day is best for us or how we like to engage in meetings versus be prepared in advance. So if we know that we all operate very differently in how we work, why make people guess? So the suggestion here is that you get clear from the very beginning of your project exactly what are the expectations for you to work successfully. So I'm not talking about the project success. I'm talking explicitly about how you work with your colleagues in that project. And we have a resource here that we'll be sending to all of you it's called Smart Start. And this is about getting set for success. So there's a, a variety of different sections in it. Our recommendation is that you take this resource and then review it, customize it for your specific situation. But before you begin working with anyone, sit down and actually have a conversation about how you work successfully with that other individual. This has been a game changer for me because it's helped me understand um, how I can best communicate with the people I work with, and it gives them a sense of how they can work with me. So we avoid some of those um, challenging situations where there's misunderstandings between people in the projects by right up front talking about how we need to work together. Um, and you can see there's a whole variety of different um, dimensions that you talk through. Um, so a couple tips in using a smart start. Again, this is not intended to be an agenda that you pass out and you go through with somebody. This is for your reference. So you'll walk through it and you'll say, you know what? I'm going to take a question from this section, a couple questions from that section, and then I'm going to cover this other area in a following discussion. 
So that's the first thing is really customize it and make it work for you. The second thing is I suggest um, you, you actually set aside a specific discussion on this topic because it's really easy to sit down in the context of everything that's going on in your particular consulting assignment and have it get lost. So I suggest when you sit down with an individual, the context for the conversation is, I want to know how we can successfully work together. And that's really um, all they need to know and understand. And then you just walk through and you both share uh, your, how, how you work together. So that's the first suggestion um, in failure proofing your projects under the project start or setup. Action number two is validate success. So you'll hear this over and over if you spend any time around me that my absolute favorite question every single time I consult or work with anybody is always, what does success look like? She does it to me all the time. And it's so helpful because then I know what you're expecting versus what might be in my head. But I say it and we're, you're just supposed to know. <laughs> And isn't that true? Sometimes on projects when we're consulting, we think that we understand what success looks like. But I have been continuously astounded at not only the difference between the person, say my project sponsor and myself and our understanding of success, but beyond that, the difference between various um, key members, whether it's of a steering team or an executive leadership team, <laughs> They're the folks that should be completely aligned in what success looks like in this consulting assignment. And more often than not, I find that what they say success is varies from person to person. So when that occurs, I know that my very first uh, task is to get them all on the same page. But it's really, really helpful because I use this as a way to kind of connect back throughout my consulting work. So this isn't my definition of success. It's that project sponsor or project leader's definition. So that as we're working together, I can say, hey, remember, you said you wanted to accomplish this, this, and this. And here's how this decision will impact your ability to be successful in that way. So that way, you're, again, you're using their language and you're validating their definition. So second thing, always at the beginning of any consulting work, make sure you're clear on what success looks like. When you think about success, I like it when you explain it to the clients in the terms of a 3D. If you're going to make a movie, what does it look like in 3D? Mm -hmm. What does it look like? What are people doing? What are people saying? Getting that level of specificity is very, very helpful because that level of specificity is where the differences around uh, start to appear. Absolutely. So that reminds me uh, of a project um, I was working on. It was a, a merger and acquisition, so an M&A project. And it was a multi-billion dollar uh, software company that had acquired, I think it was about an $80 million um, project or, uh, software. I think it was a software development company as well. So anyhow, um, what was interesting is I was following my own advice here and I went and spoke with all of the key executives and just said, hey, what does success look like? Now, it was really amusing because I um, focus a lot on changing culture work. Um, I kept hearing over and over, well, culture really matters. We love the culture of this new organization. But yet, whenever I said, what's your definition of success? Guess what? there was absolutely no reference whatsoever in their definition of success of culture change. So they kept talking about, oh, it's so wonderful. We acquired this company and we think their culture is fabulous and we want it to be part of our culture. And then when I asked what success was, to Scott's point about trying to get multiple dimensions, their consistent answer was the business case. And as you all probably know, the business case is all about numbers, right? So are we going to make the numbers or not? And it was really sad because there's, there was so much potential. If they had included in that definition of success elements of culture, that would have radically changed the integration. But instead, they all decided that they were going to focus on the numbers. And so that's what drove success for them. And, and what happened? <laughs> unfortunately, uh, just focusing on the numbers generally never works out. And this was no exception. Exactly. So 
Um, action number two, always validate success so that you're clear. All right, the third action was a key learning for me, and hopefully this will be really useful for all of you. Now, I always understood that it was important to build relationships and that trust really mattered, but in Edgar Schein's book called Humble Consulting, he actually talks about this various levels of relationship. And why this was so useful to me was he differentiated between like a, like a friendship and being buddy buddy with somebody versus having an open, trusting and just safe relationship. And the key here is that at a level one relationship, this is when you see the people around you that you're working with as, um, you know, they're either roadblocks getting in your way or people that just need to deliver and get something done for you. And when you have that type of relationship, you're not getting the most out of, of those individuals. It's only when you are viewing people as a whole person and really connecting with them in this way, building trust, um, that you get a different way of working together. So this is a really important thing to be conscious of, to say, where am I at in terms of building relationships? And then there's a distinction between this level and a level three, which is what you, a type of relationship you would have with your friends or family. And that's a more intimate relationship where you're more deeply connected. But you always want to work in any consulting situation at building a level two relationship where um, people understand your capability and you're able to bring credibility so that they listen and hopefully follow your advice. As you begin your consulting projects, the three things are to set expectations, define success, and build a level two relationship. So once you have started, then you're in the middle of whatever the project is, whatever that consulting assignment is that you're working on. And at this particular stage, there are a couple key things we recommend. First of all, when I say no assumptions, here's what I mean by that. Especially for those of you who are very experienced, it's easy to try to uh, just kind of lump people in the same category and assume that you know exactly what needs to happen. And based upon your wisdom and your experience, you probably do. But the suggestion here is be curious and bring your brilliance. Because too often, we bring band-aids instead of true full solutions. So as you're working through um, whatever the work is that you're doing and applying the methodology for the consulting work that you're doing, the suggestion is maintaining an open mind and just staying curious. Ask lots of questions. It's one of our um, favorite pastimes, right? Scott is collecting and asking as many questions as possible. Yes, it's become my favorite pastime. <laughs> it's not how I was wired to start with. Yes, but it's enabled so much greater levels of success because we're asking instead of assuming. I'm glowing with success. <laughs> so the second thing we recommend in project implementation is a coaching mindset. Now, stay with me for a minute because this might be a little bit interesting. I'm not suggesting that you're offering coaching or you're walking into your project sponsor, your teammates, like, hi, I'm your coach. But this is more from a mindset perspective. So this is always in the context of the success definition that was agreed upon. But as you're working through the project, as you're consulting and whatever it is that you're doing, constantly look for ways that you can reinforce that definition of project success because it will help keep everybody on the same path. And as you are failure proofing your project, it, it ensures kind of consistent alignment. So I like to think of this as periodic check-ins. This isn't a status report. Um, this is really saying, hey, we're moving along, we've accomplished this. It's sort of like tying a bow on your project periodically throughout the project. Um, and it's affirming the value and the accomplishment um, at various points during the project. So um, when I talk about reinforcing project success, I'm not talking about the ultimate conclusion of whatever the consulting assignment is that you're working on, but actually throughout the course of the project. Um, you know, for example, I might be in the middle of a facilitation 
and say, hey, we were trying to solve this problem and look at all this great input that we've gathered that's going to help us move to the final solution. So we haven't actually accomplished success yet, but we're moving in that direction and it's just really helpful to reaffirm that for everybody. And so um, that connects to that second point there, affirming words and behavior. So whatever it is that you're working on in your consulting, when you see people catch people doing things that are in support of your definition of success, tell them that. Um, it's something that's sadly missing in our work world where we think people have to be extraordinary in order to be worthy of a compliment. But as much as possible, look for ways that you can affirm and encourage people in the work that they're doing on your project. And that is a way to help failure proof your project, whatever that consulting assignment is. Now, a couple things in the middle, in the midst of your implementation, I wanted to share some thoughts on change. And many of you probably have a great deal of experience. This is probably a review. But I think it's helpful to remember these concepts as we're working with a project sponsor because they may not have that same level of understanding that you do. So the first thing to remember is that leadership or whoever that the sponsor is of your consulting assignment, um, how well they lead that is the number one reason for success or failure. And uh, you can reference ProSize studies for the last 20 years. That has been the consistent reason for success. So that just helps you um, kind of coach your project sponsor about the importance of the, their role. And then helping them understand a couple change challenges. Now this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is very helpful to keep in mind these few things. The first is the relay race of change. And um, I, the shiny object syndrome often plays into this. But what it means is that at a leadership level, people get really excited about an idea. Then they um, decide to implement or move forward in whatever that idea is, and then they hand that off. And it might be to a next level leader, to a manager, to a change team, or it might be one of you serving on a project. And then they move on to the next one, and they get another new idea, and then they hand that one down. And that's where it can get really overwhelming in an organization because of the number of changes. So it's very helpful um, as you're working on an assignment, just to test, you know, if the work that you're doing is going to result in additional projects in the organization, test that against everything else that's going on and see if there's a way of leveraging something else that's happening rather than starting something brand new. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is change saturation. So, uh, and, and one other point about the relay race of change, that with, when there are a lot of changes going on, it competes for the limited attention and capacity in an organization. So that connects to this next concept, which is change saturation. Now, this particular concept comes from the brilliant Daryl Connor. He uses this very simple analogy to explain how we all have a capacity for change. And unfortunately, when that capacity runs out, when that sponge is full, people move into dysfunctional behavior. So what that means for all of us doing consulting is that we have to be very aware of how much change is going on and people's capacity for absorbing more. So it's something we need to be aware of and we need to help our project sponsors be aware of. All right, so we talked about um, that relay race of change. We talked about change saturation. And then the next thing I wanted to chat about is brain filters. What I wanted to convey here is that all the data, and you can see at the bottom, 400 million bits of data is coming at you constantly, every second. And only 2,000 of that 400 billion bits of data is actually processed by your brain. And then it goes through a bunch of filters. So our, we're not trying to to uh, complicate things, but simply saying that whatever it is you're working on is competing with a whole lot in order to get attention and to make it happen. So it's something important to be aware of as you are consulting. Recognize that whatever you're working on is competing with lots of other information. Now, in addition to that, um, consulting is all about 
a change of some sort, helping people change. And unfortunately, our brain kind of likes to be in neutral. Um, <laughs> there's so much going on that as much as possible, it likes to be in this autopilot mode. So it's important to understand as you're consulting, whatever change you're trying to make happen, that you have to kind of overwrite the neural pathways in people's brains to help them create new habits in order to ensure that change occurs. And if you're interested in a resource there, BJ Fogg is a fantastic um, researcher from, uh, I think it's USC in California, or BJ Fogg, F-O-G-G -G is who you wanna look up. All right. So in addition to talking about the brain filters and the fact that our brains are on autopilot. Eric, I, I also said that it's uh, Stanford. Stanford, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, the other thing to remember is that your brain is instantly processing the information and is either responding in a threat or a reward fashion. And why does this matter during change and during your implementation? What's really critical to pay attention to is the outcome of your consulting work um, going to create a threat to the people that are you're working with or that you are implementing that change for. And if so, you need to be aware of that and pay attention to how you can start overcoming that. So what do I mean by that? An example of a threat is uncertainty. I just talked about how brains love to be sure and certain about what's going on. That's, then they can go on autopilot. So change, which is usually the outcome of any consulting work that you're doing, um, creates uncertainty. And uncertainty is perceived by your brain as a threat. So the opportunity for the change sponsor, the, the project sponsor that you're working with, is how can we create certainty in this situation? So maybe it's a tremendous system change that's being made Certainty can be created by um, the schedule that you put out, or it gets created by um, giving people experience working with the system. So it's important, again, to take away from this that there may be threats and rewards from the very consulting work that you're doing that you need to take into account um, in, in order to ensure success in your project. So again, in project implementation, as you are working through this, you wanna make sure that you are coaching your sponsor. And as I said, that, that doesn't mean that you're taking them on as a coaching assignment. This is where you are um, reinforcing what's going well, continuing to refer them back to the definition of success and helping them be successful. Because remember, without them leading well, chances are a change won't be successful. So that's the goal here in implementation is that you're coaching your sponsor in their role and helping them be the best change leader possible. And then with um, everybody around you throughout the course of that implementation, reinforcing, hey, this is going well, or hey, here's how we've made progress and helping people see that things, um, things are moving forward. And the reason for that is because it gives you a little dopamine shot. It helps your brain feel happy and that creates positive motivation in the right direction. Again, helping failure-proof your project. And then the last part here in project implementation, we encourage affirming words and behavior that's helping move you in the direction of success. So all three critical elements during project implementation. Did you know that uh, cocaine and dopamine, cocaine produces dopamine in the brain. The only difference between complimenting somebody or making them feel good on dopamine versus taking cocaine is that cocaine blocks the reuptake so you can literally get high by making people, by complimenting people and making them feel good about what they just did. So just say no to drugs, but say yes to compliments and praise. That's where I was going. All right. Outstanding. Thanks, Scott. All right. So the last kind of component in any consulting project is that you're closing out the project. And here is where we've got two specific actions that we recommend. And that is wrap it up and transition well, and then reinforce success. So what I mean by wrap it up, so many times, and you probably um, internally or externally, where whatever your consulting role is, you've experienced situations where you're 
under a time pressure and you're moving, moving, moving. And then you finally get to that point where, okay, we're done. And then it's like everything quick disband and you move on to the next thing. And I'm suggesting that you want to plan your ending end well. And that means not just um, reinforcing all the things that were accomplished successfully, but also ensuring that whatever needs to happen to move from the implementation of your consulting recommendations so that uh, to that kind of ongoing, um, actually uh, realizing the results of the work that you're doing, that you take the time to do that well. So this is not exactly like a lessons learned that might for some of you might think that's sort of what it is, but we're not talking about lessons learned. We're really saying, how do we end well and be intentional about that? Um, because again, I find so many times on consulting assignments that I work, work on, there's sort of a scramble at the end and there's not really an opportunity to put a bow around it and um, help everybody understand why it's gone well and then that second part around reinforcing success is really important. It's saying here, remember that definition of success? Here's how we said we are going to achieve success. Well, we did. And so I'm suggesting that throughout the project, throughout whatever consulting assignment that you're working on, you need to consistently reinforce success and really think of yourself as a success coach. So you stay focused on the goal. Remember in the beginning section where we talked about defining what success looks like. So you just stay focused on that and keep everybody's attention drawn to that and then remind people, hey, we've done this and this and we're that much closer to accomplishing success. And then serving as a cheerleader along the way. Um, as Scott mentioned, that can be very rewarding for people's brains and that when you reward people in that way, you're actually amping up their ability to be productive. That's the best part because I've worked with leaders sometimes who have this mindset and I don't know if you've experienced this too, but they think like, oh, as long as somebody's doing their job, I shouldn't have to tell them they, that they're doing a good job. And what they miss out on is that simply by catching people in the act of being great and doing a good job, regardless of whether it's what they're supposed to do, um, it encourages them and it gives them that little jolt that helps them be that much more productive. Did you catch that little uptick in her voice? I just smiled at her and did a thumbs up and she smiled and started talking a little bit faster. <laughs> so that was a, a lot in, in live discussion or example, right, Scott? That's correct. And I've also seen how this can work the opposite way. I used to be pretty good at it. How's that work the opposite way? It shuts people down and you don't get what you want. Oh, right. Right. So that's a great point. If you, if you focus on what's going wrong in a project and you're constantly bringing people's attention to what isn't working out, that's what you're talking about, that you're shutting people down. That's correct. So um, great, great insight. So it works both ways that when you're affirming success and reminding people along the way, hey, this is going well, good job. Um, that's giving them a boost of energy versus, hey, you screwed that up. What's your problem? Which eliminates people's ability to be productive. All right. And then um, the suggestion here is affirming completion. Um, I would say it eliminates people's ability. They can still fake productivity, yes. but they're not as efficient and effective as they otherwise would be. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, if we had more time, we could get into all the brain chemicals and how that um, works because that promotes cortisol, which is the stress hormone that shuts down the um, neuroepinephrine and all those other fun things. Yeah, which sits on the prefrontal cortex and means that people are not in their most productive creative. Anyhow, so we'll save this for a podcast. <laughs> so you're a success coach. And our suggestion is that regardless of the consulting work that you're doing, Look for ways throughout your consulting assignment to um, continuously encourage that success. And then when you've concluded, affirm that completion. It's really interesting because when you're so close to the assignment that you're working on, you know, might know that it's done. But I always believe in reminding the entire, you know, whether it's a team you're working with, the project sponsor you're working with, remind them of what's been completed. Connect the dots for them. And when you do that, you're acting as the success coach so people see how all the pieces fit together. Sounds really basic, but it's incredibly powerful 
conclusion. And I think that people, there is there, depending upon how long a project goes, I've noticed that people's reality or expectations about what they set out to do tends to change as they go through it. So when you're talking about what was accomplished, point back to what they said, what was the journey all about? What were they trying to accomplish? Because they're thinking about it may have evolved over the way. And sometimes they become dissatisfied with where they're at because, oh, I could have done this difference or I should have done that, so on and so forth. That's a great point. Um, as they say, vision leaks, I guess the definition of success leaks as well and what we're thinking about. We're not talking about lying to them that what they have just sucks and their plan from the beginning was horrible, but it's pointing out, you know, the good things that have been done and how the, um, they're in a better state. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So as much as possible, um, reinforce success and remember whether it's the beginning, middle, end of the consulting work that you're doing, how can you shape um, your work around being a success coach? So what we talked about today is that when you are failure proofing your projects, um, we believe that you need to start with yourself and really consider how you can operate at the peak level of energy with a peak level of performance, whether that means studying flow or any other um, ways that you can be at your best, because when you're at your best, that's when you deliver well. It's about investing in yourself on a continual basis. Absolutely. Donna and I spend an incredible amount of time learning, growing. I think if Donna could just do one thing for the rest of her life, she'd be a professional conference attendee or a professional course goer <laughs> reading books on airplanes in between the conferences. That sounds pretty fun. Anybody here have a job like that that's available? I'll bring the wine. <laughs> I'll be first in line. So again, learning is really important. And so I appreciate that you brought that up, Scott. But what I love about um, the powerful engagement and then the corporate athlete course that we did but it's, it's beyond just um, improving your mind and getting better at what you do. It's also about how you take care of yourself. And that was a really important learning. Um, I don't know for all of you, if you grew up in an era where um, you would like boast of how many hours you worked. Uh, Scott and I both worked in um, large consulting firms where it was cool to work a lot of hours. Yeah, I used to boast about how I'd go to my best my best story is I went to work on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in Austin, Texas, and I went to bed at 7 o'clock in the morning in San Jose, California. What an awesome day that was. Except for you really operating at your peak. If they could see the sarcasm written on my <laughs> face. Right. So what we've learned are the importance, um, again, not just of learning for your mind, but also um, in taking care of yourself, the importance of sleep, of eating, of movement, um, Another really impactful um, lesson we had, we read David Rock's Your Brain at Work. And it was interesting because in there it talks about, um, you know, how your brain can get exhausted and you can try pushing it and pushing it. And so Scott and I would have those times where we're working on a project or doing something from a consulting standpoint, you're trying to get it done. I remember it was 11 o'clock at night and we were struggling. We just finished reading this book and it just dawned on me. Why are we doing this? Right. But we know that we probably could have gotten to the answer by three o'clock in the morning. Instead, we shut everything down, um, went to bed, got up the next morning, and I believe by 7 a.m. we had the problem solved. Exactly. So by understanding, um, thinking of your brain as a resource and how to leverage it to get the most out of it was very transformational in our consulting work. And so we encourage what you know, whatever you're interested in, pay attention to how your brain works because you're gonna get more productivity out of it um, in the work that you do. Um, every hour, every 50 minutes, make sure you stand up or move around for at least 10 minutes. Well, yeah, that was another interesting thing that we learned in Corporate Athlete. Yes. So the idea was, um, it was really fascinating. You probably all heard how uh, sitting is, wait, what is it? Sitting is the new smoking? That's correct. And, um, okay, great. So what does that really mean? Well, what we heard through at the corporate athlete was that when you sit, you're sitting on the largest muscles in your body and you're effectively telling your body to go into sleep state. Yeah. So it's just like when you close the top of your laptop and you put the cover down, that's what you're doing to your body. That's right. Because the, 
if you get up and move around, your thigh muscles, which are the biggest muscles in your body, will start blood flow moving through your body and it will start your energy moving and get your brain reactivated again. Not to mention the fact that having what I've learned from the flow classes is having a mental break and allowing some recovery time um, is also very, very important. Right. So all these things together, taking care of yourself, as well as paying attention to the work that you do through these various stages will help you failure proof your projects and be that much more successful. So this is another audience participation opportunity. I'd love to hear from all of you who are on the webinar, something that you're gonna do differently to failure proof your projects. So based on everything that we talked about today, what is it that you're gonna do? How are you going to um, apply what you've learned. And you can see at the top, the first thing that needs to happen is make a decision. What are you going to do different? Make a commitment, and then you'll drive to success. Then I would just like to share a couple final closing thoughts with you. The first one is this quote, and I'm going to read it, even though I'm sure all of you are reading it as, um, as you're seeing it up on your screen. And that is almost every successful person begins with two beliefs that the future can be better than the present, and I have the power to make it so. So as you failure-proof your projects and drive to success, then I would suggest these are two key beliefs that you possess or that you would um, ensure are part of your mindset um, as you do your consulting work. So, this brings me to something really exciting I wanted to share with you. Um, we had so much fun um, at the Million Dollar Consulting Convention and then preparing for this presentation. And we've heard a lot of really positive response. So we're interested in whether there's anybody internally, externally serving as a consultant that would love to explore with us how to continue to improve. So we're going to be piloting um, this course around um, successful consulting at the speed of life, exploring some of the things we talked about today and even beyond that, um, some of my favorite things, like as I facilitate how I use um, visual um, ways of engaging people in content. So we're going to do as much as possible sharing resources and insights and ideas to continue to improve your consulting capability. So if that sounds interesting to you, um, check out that bit.ly link, sign up, and um, we'll tell you more. And then. Next actions, we would love to hear from you. Um, I know in our past webinars, we've gotten awesome and fabulous messages from some of our participants with sharing their thoughts, sharing their comments, sharing their struggles. So if you'd like to, um, we'd love to hear from you, share what's on your mind. And then we are going to be holding a, uh, another webinar on June the 19th. We're talking about change leadership. So if you are serving in a consulting role, this is beneficial to you because it's a toolkit that you can share with your change leaders or change um, sponsors, your project leaders, project sponsors. Um, and if you know leaders, this is beneficial to them. And what we're getting at here is when somebody is leading a change, and we're not talking about their role in a single change, this is a person in a leadership role who is responsible for um, kind of multiple changes being successful. And so we're gonna talk about what that looks like and that's gonna be in the context of the Change Leader Toolkit. We're gonna to make that available to everyone. Um, we've got that in a variety of forms. So for those of you who are OneNote fans, we have customized OneNote pages and you'd be able to take advantage of those. Um, and we also have them in template form. So we're gonna walk through that and share that with all of you. And if you know anybody else who might be interested, pass that on to them. So I want to thank all of you for your participation and um, loved having you on with us today. Scott, is there anything in closing that you wanted to add? Yeah, I want to say I agree with Dean completely. Yay, one note. <laughs> so Dean, you're a fan. That's way cool. We have a one note farm here. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, again, because it's been such a beneficial tool for us, um, we actually took all the tools and templates and translated that into uh, OneNote pages to um, make those even easier to use. So in closing, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you that joined us 
um, we're going to send you a follow-up message with a recording with a copy of the slides. You'll get access to that Smart Start conversation guide that you can use um, to start off your projects and talk about how to successfully work with somebody. And, um, and then we'll also share with you that link if you'd be interested in joining us on an adventure talking about how we can collectively improve our consulting work. Hey, John, um, we're actually, I can answer that question. He said, what is the wine for the day? So uh, this evening we're going to dinner. We'll be drinking a vertical of uh, El Nido Clio. It is a wine from Spain. We'll be drinking 2005, 2006, and 2007. And Scott, why is that such an awesome thing? That's the wine that changed my life. So for those of you who never heard the story, how did Cleo change your life, Scott? That's a long story. <laughs> so they'll have to join us on another webinar? Yes, they will. All right. So we'll leave you in a state of suspense about um, why Cleo is such an important wine. But John, now you know what's being consumed this evening is a vertical of Cleo. So thanks again, everybody. We hope you have a wonderful Wednesday wherever you are in the world. And we look forward to you joining us in June. Have a spectacular day. Cheers.